Hello and welcome to the Philosophical Research Society. Thank you for joining us this evening for Dr. Sandra Del Castillo's talk, Jung and the Mexican Day of the Dead, Reimagining Death and Ancestors. My name is Matthew Taylor and I'm the director of the online school here at PRS. We have a great variety of upcoming events here on campus as well as classes that you can take online and you can see all of them on our website at prs.org. It's difficult to choose highlights when they're all so great, but a couple of the many events to look forward to include a conversation with legendary horror filmmaker Tom Holland put on by the Miskatonic Institute of Horror Studies. That will be a week from today, Tuesday, October 25th at 7.30 p.m. Towards the end of the month, we're having a Halloween-themed magic lantern show. That'll be Friday, October 28th at 7 p.m. Our online classes are also available for people anywhere in the world to take. It just so happens that Sandra has just put together an excellent course titled Jung, Myth, and the Archetypal Imagination. That begins on Friday, November 4th, and registration is open on our website. The material is extremely engaging and illuminating. There's currently an early bird discount available for registration. So tonight's speaker, Dr. Sandra Del Castillo, is a teacher, lecturer, ritual artist, and storyteller. She received her doctorate degree in depth psychology with a specialization in Jungian and archetypal studies from Pacifica Graduate Institute, where she teaches adjunct. Born in California, Sandra is of Mexican indigenous descent. She lived in Mexico for 15 years, where she studied Mesoamerican mythology, indigenous medicine, and the arts. She also taught and acted as interpreter for a Liberation Theology Retreat Center. As a ritual artist, her art is inspired by dreams, mythology, and active imagination. Sandra has performed and exhibited her artwork throughout Mexico. Through scholarship and ritual art, it is her aim to share the wisdom of Mesoamerica and give birth to the ancient in a new time, as Jung proposed. Please join me in welcoming Sandra Del Castillo. Good evening, all. Thank you so much for being here. Um, thanks, Matthew, for that generous uh, introduction and to Dennis and Kelly for inviting me. Um, I, I do want to say that the Philosophical Research Society really brings it to the people, makes courses you know, really accessible. If you are remotely interested in Jungian, I, I really <laughs> encourage you to take the course because that Jungian psychology courses, you know, whether they're five weeks, which is my course, or you know, for one class, they're expensive, and the you know PRS really makes it accessible, and I think that's so cool. James Hillman, who was a Jungian and founder of Archetypal Psychology, he said we have to bring Jungian psychology out of the you know, out of the, the offices and into the streets, and I feel like that's what PRS is doing in a really good way. Anyway, thank you. Thank you for being here. We have um, a lot, I have a lot to unpack this evening and I'm always encouraged to see people willing to come and, and, and talk about death. <laughs> it's so taboo in our culture and um, it takes a little bit of courage. And, and this evening when you open the door like that from a Jungian perspective, you know, you really wanna suit up and, and you know, get your psychonaut gear going because we have some traveling to do. So welcome, thank you. Um, so we're gathering this evening when, when the veil between the world's parts, right? And it's timely because, you know, we, we, um, we're here to explore death and the archetypal wisdom of indigenous um, civilizations. And that was the true goal that was lost uh, to the Spanish conquest. So, you know, in, in that spirit, you know, as we 500 years later, as we face this existential crisis, um, we, you know, we, we, um, it, we were turning to these ancient ways, this knowledge that we lost. 
And in that spirit, I'd like to first acknowledge the Tongva people, the first people of these lands that we call Los Angeles. May their wisdom once again thrive throughout these lands. May they thrive and may we all thrive through this challenging period, our own mythic descent. Anyway, thank you. So that said, let's, let's get started. So the Mexican Day of the Dead, I mean, it really is unique. It's a tradition that venerates the ancestors. It has its roots in two worlds, Mesoamerica and the 16th century Spanish Catholicism. Mesoamerica, Spain, you know, people say, what is Mesoamerica? Well, here it is. There's a, there's a map, right? It spanned um, southern two thirds of mainland Mexico and most of Central America. It is estimated to have begun between 1200 to 1400 uh, before the common era. And it ended as such with the Spanish conquest. Mesoamericans lived in small to large scale city states, which arose alongside agriculture and they it revolved around vast ceremonial centers. Prominent civilizations include the Olmecs, Toltecs, Toltecas, I want to say Maya, and the Aztecs. With the conquest, the Mesoamerican civilizations came to an end, a brutal end, and a nation was born. And um, through the centuries, the Mexican soul and the Mexican people continue to breathe life into this ancient and ever unfolding ritual celebration of the dead. This evening's presentation draws from my personal experience living in Mexico, in a region that was renowned for the tradition, and my cultural heritage, which is Purépecha from the people of Michoacán. It also comes from my dissertation, which was a Jungian inquiry on this theme. We'll be looking at concepts of the afterlife of the soul, underworld mythology, and the ensouled worldview or cosmovision. So I'll open with a quote from Carl Gustav Jung, the Swiss psychologist, psychiatrist, visionary, alchemist, well, sort of, um, artist and wizard, if you will, whose lens guides us on this journey. This is from the Red Book. To give birth to the ancient in a new time is creation. This is the creation of the new, and that redeems me. Salvation is the resolution of the task. The task is to give birth to the old in a new time. So as Jung saw it, and most of us, death is humanity's greatest mystery. And he felt that we should do our best to get, at least have some you know, conception of it, some understanding of it, some image of it. Well, this evening's presentation is an attempt to do that. It's been the role of depth psychology since its inception to excavate the soul realms. And those in Jungian um, understanding are reflected in dreams, mythology, um, imagination, <clears throat> and fairy tales. The mythic underworld in particular gives image to the afterlife of the soul. That is the psychological processes that the soul undergoes in this profound rite of passage. So as you noted, when we dare to contemplate death, we're faced with a paradox. Um, one from the point of view of, of the body and the other from the, the ego and the other from the point of view of the psyche the soul. In his words, death is indeed a fearful piece of brutality. There's no sense pretending otherwise. The cruelty and wantonness of death can be so, can so embitter us that we conclude there is no merciful God, no justice, and no kindness. From the soul's point of view, however, it is a wedding, a mysterium conjunctionis. So, which means in alchemical terms, a mysterious union. The soul attains, as it were, its missing half. It achieves wholeness. 
Here, Jung opens wide the mystery of death. He resurrects it from its taboo status in Western modernity. And where death has been silenced, it's been reduced to physiological concern, concerns and, and it's been denied. This coincided with the enlightenment and the industrial revolution. In Jung's view, however, death isn't an end. Rather, it's a path to wholeness. It's the soul's telos or aim, right? The telos is, is, is basically the, the unseen evolutionary purpose that's unfolding in human experience. So through this lens, we, we turn to Mexico. Prior to the conquest, Lake Pátzcuaro was perceived as the doorway to the underworld. This once crystalline blue lake is 50 square miles and located in the state of Michoacán, home to the Purépecha people and my ancestry on my father's side. Every year, thousands flock to this lake to participate in its vibrant celebration of the dead. In the 1990s, my three children and I lived in this largely indigenous region for six years. With year round festivals, the enchantment was truly palpable, especially on the night of the dead, when in graveyards all around this mountain lake, death comes to life. Preparations to honor the departed begin approximately mid-October, when the Purépecha people descend from the surrounding mountain villages to fill the 16th century plazas and marketplaces with their arts and crafts, many of them bearing the grinning faces of death or brightly painted devils, ceramic skeletons and sugar skulls, fragrant marigolds, candied squash, fresh, fresh pastry for the dead, and paper cutouts of the gangly skeletons hang like prayer flags throughout the plazas and marketplaces. The resiny aroma of copal incense travels in waves as it fills the senses. Finally, on the night of November 1st, in these chilly mountain villages surrounding the lake, families wrap up to prepare the grave sites and they honor their dead in a sea of marigolds and flickering candlelight. Copal incense wafts through the air as families share traditional foods, hot spiced punch, prayers and stories into the wee hours. I recall the small children running from gravesite to gravesite, singing a prayer to be richly rewarded with a piece of, of pan de muertos, which is the pastry for the dead or some other goodie from the picnic, um, graveyard picnics. La Catrina has become the iconic face of this festivity, meaning the fashionable lady she is flowerful and sometimes really psychedelic, and she's the grinning face of death. Exemplifying the cultural blend of the um, Mesoamerican death goddesses and the Spanish culture, which brought, who brought with them the medieval attitude that death comes mockingly to us all. La Catrina was first illustrated as such by the Mexican artist Jose Guadalupe Posada, he was an early 20th century painter and lithographer. Targeting the classist Mexican society of the early 20th century, La Catrina's image was part of a series of prints in which all of the characters were skeletons mimicking everyday life. Um, so the series was used in social reporting as manifestos and political and social satire. The popularity of Posada's figures inspired the Mexican artists of the time, including Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo, to mention only a few. Th this tradition still goes on, the, the, and you'll find that uh, the politicians, I mean, it's a great heyday to, to create what they call calaveras, which are like rhymes that make fun of the politicians, you know, in showing them as, as la muerte, as death, right? As a symbol of death, La Catrina is uniquely Mexican. Yet, as an archetype of death, she's also universal. As Jung indicated, the archetype is always an image belonging to the whole human race and not merely to the individual. So what is an archetype? Well, that's a key term, right? 
and he, he adapted it to mean the psychic potentialities that are inherited and living in the unconscious. Think of them as qualities and styles of consciousness. You know, they're they're um, universal patterns that um, compensate and correct in a meaningful manner our otherwise one-sidedness and excessiveness of, of the ego or the conscious mind. So they only appear, because they are potentialities, they only appear, appear secondarily in, in images of myth, dreams, um, religion, symbols. So in, in this vein, Jung called death an archetype, rich in secret life. It seeks to attach itself to our life in order to make it whole. So we can imagine then La Catrina as an archetypal vessel. Her ironic and bedazzling image would serve to compensate the characteristic denial of death in Western consciousness. La Catrina's popularity rises together with the enchanted days of the dead, which crosses borders and even continents and centuries. In the US, this tradition has been given life by the Mexican American pop culture and art world. Festivals take place in cemeteries where La Catrina takes center stage. This phenomenon in modern Western culture would seem to point to a telos, right? You know, a, a conscious of, of a conscious universe. As an ever evolving species and cosmos, death must be integrated as it is in nature. Regardless of whether we choose to acknowledge it, death demands our attention, appearing as La Catrina or in dreams or COVID or our sixth great extinction. Honoring the ancestors is a tradition that stretches back into antiquity the world over. In Mesoamerica, the veneration of the dead coincided with the harvest. It became the most extensive and exuberant festivity of the year. The ties between the living and the dead community were particularly significant to the indigenous farmers then as now. The ofrendas or altars were considered an exchange with the ancestors, the food, flowers, incense, and prayer attracted positive life force. The Harvard divinity professor and anthropologist David Carrasco tells us the Mesoamericans believed that the ancestors were deeply and directly involved in the health and reproduction of the family and community, as well as in the success of the harvest. Moreover, if the dead were not remembered, nurtured, or worshipped in the manner that adhere, adhering to custom, the, the, their family's stability, financial security, and health would be compromised. This belief required careful and generous preparations for the dead and continues to this day in many of the rural parts of Mexico and Guatemala among the Maya people. This notion was expressed in the entire ritual system of most Mesoamerican cultures from their agricultural ties to their burial practices. It sprung from a worldview which embraced a life-death duality as mirrored in nature where regeneration or rebirth was implicit. In addition, the people were under the protection of the ancestral gods. Ancestral gods were select humans who were deified after their death for their great works on earth. The ancestral gods were usually the departed nobility, such as Hanab um, Bakal, who's pictured here. Um, he ruled for 68 years from 615 to 683 um, of the common era. Bakal was beloved for the golden age that he brought the people of Palenque. So he's depicted on his tomb shown here as entering the underworld 
with the setting sun, the implication being that he would rise again, be regenerated with, with the rising sun. To venerate the ancestral gods, the family's ancestral sh shrines were diligently tended, and that pleased the, the ancestral gods. Um, they, in turn, kept the, the, the fields fertile. They kept the lineage productive, and they assured uh, triumph in war. Crucially, it was believed that the ancestors, without the ancestors, the world would collapse. That's such an interesting notion when we think about it in terms of consciousness, right? When we think, let's, let's just replace the word world collapsing with consciousness. That's something that we've seen repeatedly since we've lost touch with these ancient cosmovisions and ensouled, ensouled worldviews. Um, in, in another part of the, this vibrant veneration to the dead uh, gives image to the interwoven tapestry of an ensouled worldview. In another part of the world, in another century, Plato called this the anima mundi, or the soul of the world. <clears throat> Centuries later, Jung reintroduced the anima mundi, which again recognizes the unitary reality between the psyche, the earth, and the cosmos. And it's embraced by an underlying order, ordering principle. James Hillman, the renowned Jungian scholar and uh, founder of archetypal psychology. He, he describes it here and he gives you a, a vision, not so much of the relationship that it has with the cosmos, but how we can see it, imagine it here on the earth. Let us imagine the anima mundi as that particular soul spark, that seminal image, which offers itself through each thing in its visible form, its availability to imagination its presence as a psychic reality. Not only animals and plants, but soul is given with each thing. God given things of nature and man made things of the street. I always like to think that's pretty radical <laughs> you know, for our Western uh, consciousness. Like ancient civilizations the world over, Mesoamericans recognize soul in all creation. Mesoamerican scholar Alfredo Lopez Austin coined the term cosmovision to amplify this notion as perceived by the Aztecs. These are his words. The cosmovision constitutes cosmic processes as the measured actions of supernatural beings with intellect, will, and the ability to communicate. Okay, so. So now we're, we're now we're looking at anima mundi in terms of the cosmos, right? Think in terms of, of astrology. Mesoamerican astronomer, priest, philosopher, poet, king, some of them were all of those things at once, right? They, they closely observed the patterned movements of the planets and stars, and they recognized a purposeful and intelligent cosmos. From this, they derived a celestially based political and social order that affected all aspects of life, from the placement and construction of city-states, temples, and family dwellings, to the creation of a mathematically precise calendar that determined agricultural and ritual practices and festivities. Mythologist Joseph Campbell found this understanding of cosmic processes the most important and culturally far-reaching in the history of the human race. Archetypal in nature, this celestially based social and political order first appeared in Mesopotamia with the rise of the ziggurats about the middle of the fourth millennium uh, BCE. It spanned centuries and continents spreading to Egypt, Crete, India, China, and finally Mesoamerica in approximately 1200 uh, BCE with the Olmec culture and the Chavin culture in Peru. In 1990, the former, 1990s, the former president of what was then Czechoslovakia 
said that only with this celestial based order would there ever be a true world democracy. Not something to get curious about. With that, let's delve deeper still. The Maya and Aztecs viewed or structured cosmic space in three realms. This one on the left, well, my left anyway. Yeah, on the left um, is a European image. So again, this was something that was archetypal. The, there was an upper world which consisted of 13 celestial spheres. The underworld, which cons uh, consisted of nine levels, usually sometimes it was eight, but it depends. Um, and then earth or middle world as it was called, right? Which encompassed a horizontal space and was divided into four cardinal points, which spread from a central axis. So for the Maya, this was symbolized by the Kinkunx, which is down below this image on the left. Um, so it's, it's a four petal flower with the center, which symbolized the center of the universe. And Nungian thought this is an image of wholeness, like the mandala. Again, the Mesoamerican universe was conceived of as fused with sacredness, resonating from the presence of deities, ancestors, and spirits who abided in the upper world and underworld and shared the middle world. Their influence determined one's destiny, place, and pertinence in the world and joined divine, and divine and mythic time with that of human time on earth. The, the, the Aztecs had a sense of dwelling in, in, in like this eternal universe that was completely alive. In a time of, of homelessness, that's a real interesting image. With the conquest, this cosmovision was crushed. For in 16th century Spanish Catholicism, only the Holy Trinity and humans had souls. It wasn't an ensouled world, but we had souls. All else was dead matter to be exploited, as were the indigenous, whom the Spaniards even debated whether they were human or had souls. I mean, it's easy to justify things that way, no? To ensure conversion, the Spanish Inquisition saw to it that should a glimmer of that soul spark that offers itself in each thing remain, either in the consciousness of the indigenous or was found anywhere to be perceived in anything other than a human or a god, it would long be feared and seen as a thing of evil. The repercu repercussions of this rupture with an ensouled world are still playing out and are everywhere to be seen. These many centuries later, as the world around us convulses in climate catastrophe and social unrest, we begin to grasp the archetypal nature of these ancient cosmovisions and the relevance today. Richard Tarnas, a cultural historian, depth psychologist, and archetypal astrologer, says that the modern psyche suffers in a disenchanted universe. A profound feeling of alienation, and spiritual estrangement have haunted the modern human being since the Cartesian, when we were subjectively separated from nature and the cosmos. Again, this is true for the human and the more than human family. As Tarnas sees it, a pivotal need exists in individuals and societies for a profound understanding of these unconscious, creative, and destructive forces and inclinations that plays such a powerful role in shaping human lives, history, and the life of the planet. And with that, we turn to the soul's afterlife destinations. We draw from Hillman, who approached death through dreams in the mythic underworld. In his view, these realms infer psychological being, where soul comes first, where we wander without flesh and bones. Uh, these are his words. Underworld images are ontological statements about the soul, how it exists in and for itself beyond life. I mean, so you can think here of an ontological statement as a perspective, a worldview, right? If, if um, the ontology of Freudian psychology says 
there is an unconscious, the ontology of a Jungian depth psychology would say there's the collective unconscious. So it's a perspective, a worldview. So with this lens, we turn to the, the Mesoamerican afterlife destinations, to both the phantasmagorical imagery of the Mesoamerican underworld mythologies, as well as the three paradises of the Aztecs. We begin with the Aztec paradises, where each soul was given a task. Tlalocan was an earthly paradise. That's what we're looking at here, okay? So it's the domain of the rain god Tlaloc. It was a land of perennial summer. Earthly fruits abounded and the inhabitants lived in constant rejoicing. All of those, you can see those little, uh, they look like maybe spirals or something. That's, that's the people singing. That's their way of communicating. I love that. Um, so in, in um, those who entered Tlalocan had either drowned or died suddenly in mostly water-related deaths. In Tlalocan, they were given the status of gods and called masters of water and the little winds. They lived in what was called the hollow, hollow mountain. That's what you're seeing there where the earth's rivers, winds, and clouds emerged to bathe the earth. Here, the ancestors merged with water's life-giving forces and actively participate in the regeneration of the earth. Donatiu Iljikak was a paradise for the warriors killed in combat and the mothers who died in their first childbirth birth, because they too were viewed as warriors. This paradise was a great tree covered plain. On the Eastern half, the warriors received the sun god daily in their full regalia. They accompanied the sun to the center of the sky. Those warriors whose shields had been pierced by arrows could look through those holes and see the sun god. The women then carried the god from the sun god from the zenith across the western sky on a litter trimmed with a sacred quetzal feathers and delivered him at dusk to the beings of the underworld. When four years had passed, the women became goddesses and the warriors were transformed into birds and butterflies and they flew back and forth from heaven to the earth, sipping the nectar of the flowers. Such a beautiful image. Chichihuacualco was a celestial paradise for the infants and young children who died. These young souls would sit peacefully drinking nectar under what was called the breast fruit tree. When it is their time, they're called back to be reborn in another incarnation. When we see these paradises in our mind's eyes, their images evoke feeling tones. As Jung put it, image is psyche. So soul, psyche is another word for soul in Jungian depth psychology. Psychology, right? So it's the, the, the language of the soul. Images are containers of the noumen, the soul spark. They're transformative in nature. This identic imagery would seem to both engage and nurture the soul. We moderns are bereft of such imagery and traditions. And again, we're left alone to navigate the unfathomable in a disenchanted world, disconnected despite the internet. So now we turn to the geography of the abyss. That center uh, picture that you see image, that's an alchemical image. That's that's death. That's the, the, the sacred wedding, the, the, mis, the mysterium conjunctionis. It's, it's a really powerful image, and that's one that does show up in dreams. So the, again, the mythic underworld consisted of nine levels for the Aztecs. Drawing from Jung's book on the Tibetan Book of the Dead, these realms would reveal the soul's initiatory process into a psychological beyond. These levels are teeming with mythic beasts and thrashing topographies, such as giant crocodiles, 
crashing hillsides or obsidian winds. You know, it was interesting because during the first, you know, wave of, of COVID, um, on a on a podcast um, called Scary Dreams, I'm trying to remember the name of it. The image of the obsidian winds and crocodiles showed up a lot in dreams. So there's that archetypal nature. There it is. So again, each represents different stages in the dissolutive process of the self as we have known it, or we've conceived it, perceived it, right? Death demons, as the Jungian scholar Edgar Herzog described them, appear in cultures the world over. They, so I'm gonna say this slowly because it's hard sort of to get this, but so they are inner crystallizations of a numinous or like divine experience into an image. So it's the experience that becomes the image itself, yeah? In which the human is secretly a part. We, we participate in that. We're not separate in an ensouled world. That's a part of us. It has a, a function, yeah? Each beast or topography carries out specific tasks in the soul's rite of passage. At the ninth and last and dark and gloomy level, one meets the underworld deities and gives them a gift. The Maya believed upon reaching the final destination, they dissolved into a cosmic energy. This is a really interesting image. Um, obviously it, it's, it's taken from um, an ancient stone and all of these, you can see these are death lords, right? And there's, there's a crocodile, I mean, you see there, really interesting. In a little bit, I'm going to describe their names, which are sort of mind-boggling. <clears throat> Shibalba is the Mayan name for the underworld. It means place of fear and place of those who vanished. Water is one of the symbols for Shibalba. Carrasco tells us that Shibalba was simultaneously the place of death and regenerative powers. It is symbolized by ancestral seeds and skulls. It, these are symbols of fertility. Shibalba is a dangerous place where, as Carrasco described it, gods and humans, human spirits struggle to deceive, trick, sacrifice, and overcome one another. In some ways, it is a sarcastic replica of life on earth. In other words, in other ways, Shibalba is a landscape of awesome, dangerous beings who usually have their way. Mayan phrases for death include enter the water and enter the road. Shibalba was also called the Black Road. It was illustrated both underwater and underground. Both are symbols of the unconscious in Jungian understanding. Shibalba, however, was not always underground. At night, it circled around, positioning itself in the night sky. As the Mayan scholars Linda Schill and David Friedel emphasized, astronomy was not just a scientific observation for the Maya. It was also a fount of vital knowledge about Shibalba and its powers. The patterns of the sky reflected the actions and interchanges of those gods, spirits, and ancestors with the earth living beings. In this vein, Jung recognized our inner most psychological processes are set up in accord with the structure of the universe. What occurs in the macrocosm occurs in the microcosm. As French philosopher Henri Corbin put it, when you go in deep enough, you experience a topographical inversion. Some of you may have experienced that before, like in Zen meditations, retreats for four days. If you're curious, ask me in the Q&A. In this last section of the presentation, I'll flesh out this notion that the cosmos holds knowledge about the underworld with the tale from the Popul Vuh, the sacred book of the Mayas. 
we recall that in depth psychology, myths describe archetypal forces and they're clothed in the cultures of the people who configure them. We know from Campbell that the gods and mythic figures represent potentials within. They are a mythopoetic way of talking about life's most essential values. Like living blueprints, they affect how we think and understand. This evening, we follow the adventures of two sets of twins. Both are heroic deities. As much as I'd like to expand on the second one, the hero twins, because those are great, mostly I'll be emphasizing the first set of twins, mostly due to time. And it's also something that I really want to, to flesh out really good and present at another um, eat a point. The mythic hero, as, as Hillman emphasized, embodies a life in service to the gods and civilization, the higher values of civilization. As we've seen, underworld mythologies serve different functions. When they deal with the tales of heroes, however, they take on distinct meaning because heroes can descend into the underworld and come back to the world of the living, right? They're the only ones that can do that. They, they of course, have to overcome terrible ordeals in the underworld, and then they return with the knowledge about the mysteries of existence, the afterlife and the powers of rebirth. As, as Carrasco points out, the hero is, who is reborn often becomes an ancestral spirit or part of a celestial body, maize plant or world tree, is now fully integrated into the celestial patterns. Again, there's the microcosm and the macrocosm. In this spirit, we turn to a time when the world was still in darkness for the Maya. The first part, the initial stories of the Popol Vuh are when the world was still in darkness. And we'll <clears throat> be looking at the adventures of, of like I said, the heroic, the heroic sets of twins whose triumphs make the sky earth a safer place for the coming of the humans. <clears throat> because these adventures took place before the creation of the first humans, these figures <clears throat> described here do not represent humans, but rather spirits, deities, and supernatural beings. These, um, while they may appear to have human traits, because they do, these traits represent primordial and archetypal forces, a priori instincts, potentials, inclinations, and impulses that are both creative and destructive. They find their dwelling place deep in the unconscious as well as in the cosmos, the, the microcosm and the macrocosm. Crucially, or the vice versa, crucially, as Mesoamerican scholar Dennis Tedlock points out, these tales take place both above ground and below ground. The sewing and dawning movements of the heroes along with their supporting cast, prefigure the present day movements of the sun, planets, and stars. The first twins are named One and Seven Hunapu, and they like to spend their days throwing dice and playing ball. The ball court where they played, however, was located on the road to Shibalba, the underworld. And so it happened one day when they were bouncing their ball around and kicking and making lots of noise that the, the ruling lords of Shibalba, one death and seven de death, heard the twins and got mad. Who dares share no respect to the great lords of Shibalba? Do they have no shame stomping over our heads? So is this envy? fear that someone somewhere is happy and their plan is to, to, their intention is to crush it? Is envy not another underworld inclination perhaps belonging to the shadow? Something that's, you know, quite um, autonomous if we haven't worked it yet, haven't brought it to consciousness. The death lords decide to send their military messengers, right? Four owls to the ball court to invite the offenders to play a game of ball with them. 
Now, according to Carrasco, that means that when you're invited by the lords of Shibalba, you have died, <laughs> right? And so begins the first twins' journey to the underworld and their many trials. One in seven Hunapu must first traverse the rustling canyon, the gurgling canyon, Scorpion Rapids, Blood River, and to finally arrive at a crossroads. Recall this geography of the abyss serves in this, the dis dissolution of the self as it has been perceived yeah, through life. Arriving at this crossroads, one in seven Hunapu must choose one of four roads, the black road, red road, yellow road, or white road. The black road leads more directly to Shibalba. The others, you know, are, are hellish mazes. So they successfully traverse the canyons and rivers. But as the Popovu says, Shibalba is packed with tests, heaps and piles of tasks. Finally, after some surmounting their many challenges, one and seven Hunapu arrive at the main council hall in Shibalba. There they are met by many death lords. Each has a commission and a domain assigned by the two main ruling lords, one and seven death. Their names suggest their grim tasks. Scab stripper, blood gatherer, Demon of pus, demon of jaundice, bone scepter, skull scepter, demon of filth, demon of woe, wing and pack strap. It's right about a Halloween horror show. No? Arriving in this main council hall, the twins are immediately subject to the trickery of the death lords. Two wooden carved mannequins had been placed to sit disguised as the two, as, as um, one in seven death. So upon seeing them, the twins immediately call out to them, morning one death, morning seven death. At this, the lords of Shibaba just went into fits of laughter. And in their hearts, they believed they had already triumphed. Next, the lords invite the twins to sit for tomorrow you will need your energy to play ball. They point to a bench, which was really a hot burning rock. Doing as they were told, the twins sit, and as their bottoms begin to burn, they begin to squirm and squiggle and jump up and down. And this you know, was really hilarious to the death lords. Finally, they, they leap off the bench and run to the nearest body of water and, and, and just immerse their bottoms. So the gods shriek with laughter. So the description here comes from the, from the Popol Vuh, and it, it, it really gives you a, a feeling for the, the kind of laughter that's coming here from the underworld, which is you know, perfect for this season because it's, it's, it's pretty, um, pretty dark. The laughter rose up like a serpent in their very cores. All the lords of Shibalba laughed themselves down to their blood and bones. Here, the laughter rising up like a serpent is more than just dark humor. It rather, it reveals like a really sinister sarcasm and sadistic intent, a dark, dark bullying, if you will. And it's representative, again, of instinctual underworld impulses. Next, the first twins, one and seven Hunapu, must enter different houses of the underworld. Those are the dark house, the rattling house, jaguar house, bat house, and razor house. Again, we see the underworld imagery as ontological statements about soul life and the beyond. Here the houses contain or become the death demons with more trickery yet to come. The twins enter the first house called the dark house. 
and a servant of the two death lords hands the twins a cigar and a torch. Both were already lit. These must be returned in the morning, not finished. The servant warns them. Of course, the cigar and torch were, they, they soon extinguished themselves. And so the next day in the council house, the ruling gods ask, where are my cigars? What of my torch? They went out, the twins answer in defeat. Very well. This day, your day is finished. You will die. You will disappear. And we shall break you off. Here you will hide your faces. You are to be sacrificed. Interesting wording here. Note the tone of the, of the death gods, right? To make them insignificant. And so it was the first twins, one and seven Hunapu were sacrificed. And in a brutal act proclaiming their victory, the gods behead one Hunapu. Only his body was buried with his twin brother at the place of ball game sacrifice. The ruling lords then put one Hunapu's head in the fork of a tree. This stood at the place of ball game sacrifice. Immediately, that tree bore fruit and it became the calabash tree. The Shibalbans and all those who lived in the underworld were amazed at the fruit of the tree, for it appeared just after they had placed the head of the twin there in its fork. The death lords frowned upon seeing it and then proclaimed to all Shibalbans who visited, no one is to pick that fruit, nor is anyone to go underneath that tree. But when the maiden Blood Moon listened to her father, Blood Gatherer, tell the story of this fruit-bearing tree, she was way too intrigued. She had to go, and despite it being strictly forbidden, Blood Moon stood directly under the tree, and she dared to gaze up into the fruit that was really the head of one Hunapu. Then, thinking quite aloud to herself, she said, Surely that fruit must be sweet. It should be eaten and not just left to die on the tree. To her amazement and awe, the fruit suddenly spoke back. Maiden, I am mere bone. You don't want me. My flesh is all gone. Oh, but I do want to taste you, Blood Moon cried. And so thinking it over, one Hunapu replied, stretch out your right hand, which she did. Then he sped out saliva, which landed squarely in her hand. Blood Moon inspected it right away, but suddenly the saliva disappeared. It's just a sign I have given you, one Hunapu told her. I am a bone, and the bones of the dead are frightening. Yet the father does not disappear, but goes on being fulfilled. So it is, I have done likewise through you. Now go up there on the face of the earth. You will not die. Keep the word, so be it. And so it was, Blood Moon became pregnant with the hero, uh, with this hero, uh, no, not with the hero, with the hero twins. So she became pregnant with the hero twins. Immaculate conception is a universal motif, motif bringing forth demigods. Note that Blood Moon must insist here that she wants to partake before one Hunapu moves forward with his plan. This proactive approach is crucial in the development of both mythic and fairy tale figures. Remember, Cinderella has to ask for her dress, right? There's, there has to be a move. So <clears throat> this proactive approach is crucial in the development of both mythic and fairy tales. One Hunapu's assertion here that after death, the father goes on being fulfilled alludes to the regenerative powers symbolized by the ancestral seeds and skulls. 
both, again, they're symbols of fertility for the Maya people. Now, when Blood Moon's father, Blood Gatherer, discover, discovers that his maiden daughter is with child, he is de he's devoured by rage. And he immediately consults the ruling death lords. And together they try to make Blood Moon confess the unborn child's parentage. But when she's called upon, Blood Moon denies the child in any man. Her enraged father then orders his owl messengers. If Blood Moon will not reveal the father, take her far away and sacrifice her. Bring back her heart. So again, a fairy tale image, right? The value of maidenhood is shown here as archetypal, as is the possessiveness of the father, instinctual in this case, potentially fatal. <clears throat> and so the owls take blood moon far away, but alas, they could not sacrifice the young maiden, right? We where have we seen this in fairy tales? Instead, the owls choose to deceive her father and make a heart out of a red resin, reminiscent of Snow White. They, so this is a quote from the, the Popol Vuh. They sent her up through a hole onto the earth. In this way, the lords of Shibalba were defeated by a maiden. All of them were blinded. So we know that the gods of both the underworld and celestial realms traveled through many different passageways to reach the middle world, caves, mountains, sacred sites. This suggests the depths and dimensions of the soul realms. The notion here that the death lords could be blinded and defeated by a maiden is something to get curious about. Remember that the maiden represents purity and the potential of new life. After arriving in the middle world, Blood Moon did not die as the death lords had warned her, though she did face her share of challenges in the home of her mother-in-law, Shmukane, the mother of one and seven Hunapu. But that's a story for another day. This is Shmukane here in Blood Moon on the, on the left. Finally, Blood Moon gives birth and the second set of twins are born. They are the hero twins, Shbalanke and Hunapu. And so begins their lifetime adventures. Sadly, too many to mention today. Suffice it to say, the hero twins live to avenge their father and uncle. They learned early on to fend for themselves because of problems at home with the mother-in-law, but they grew not only strong and agile, but sound of heart and mind. Here we begin to see the, the, the mythic hero. Through their, though their journeys were wrought with peril, like most mythic heroes, they had a divine patron, a creator God named Heart of the Sky. He helped the hero twins defeat the many evils of the self-magnified beings who in their hubris and excess wreaked havoc in the time before dawn. In their aim to make the sky earth a safer place, the hero twins personify the role of the mythic hero in, serve, in service to the gods, meaning higher values and civilization. The hero twins most transformative and heroic feats would occur in the underworld. And they really are. I, I know this one is, is sort of like a, a more violent looking, but they, they do wonderful things <laughs> to trick the uh, death lords in the underworld. Um, unlike the first set of twins, their father and uncle, the hero twins had fortune on their side for their mother was from the underworld. And like their father and uncle, they too liked playing ball. And they too offend the death lords by playing ball. And they too are invited to the underworld. But Shpalanke and Hunapu are clever. 
and they decide to keep their parentage secret from the lords of Shibalba. Because their mother, Blood Moon, was from the underworld, the hero twins possessed hidden skills, which the first twins did not. And so that, with the help of unsuspecting allies, the hero twins triumphed in all the tasks and all of the houses that the ruling lords set before them. Ultimately, they defeat the greedy and corrupt death lords. Only when their death, only when their defeat was certain did the hero twins finally reveal their identities to all the Shibalban lords. They told of their mission to avenge their father and uncle, the first twins, one and seven Hunapu, for their lives were cut short for simply playing ball. Because the hero twins had defeated their rulers, the Shibalbans and all the death lords now feared them and they asked for pity. And while the hero ten, twins spared their lives, they left strict stipulations for their behavior, even rules about who dies. This is from the Popol Vuh. These will be the guilty, the violent, the wretched, the afflicted. Wherever the blame is clear, that is where you will come in, rather than just making sudden attacks on people in general. And you will hear petitions. The Shibalbans quickly agreed. From a depth perspective, such bold demands aim to restore balance between the cycles of life and death, again, to make the sky earth a safer place for the coming of the humans. They, they also speak to the mystery and notion that even the gods evolve when challenged. It's also something to get curious about. This is something that we see throughout, especially in creation myths, when the gods need the humans. In their final task, the hero twins travel to the place of the ball game sacrifice and to the calabash tree to see their father. He asks, one Hunapu, ask him, please, sons, please restore my head as it once was. Let it be buried with my body. His body here is portrayed in the image as a maize plant emerging from the earth, again, a symbol of rebirth and regeneration. However, because their father's heart had been sacrificed by the Shibalbans, it was to remain at the place of ball game sacrifice. The hero twins explain, you will be prayed to here, father, by those born in the light, begotten in the light of the first true dawn. We have cleared the road for your death, your loss, the pain, suffering that were inflicted upon you. By defeating the lords of death and remembering their dismembered father, the hero twins have cleared the road for him in the afterlife. We recall that an ancestor, the father does not disappear as one who Napu asserted to Blood Moon, but rather goes on being fulfilled as his image here as a plant may suggest. It would also infer a psychological evolution beyond the personal life on earth, which in this context is dependent upon and integral to this tradition venerating the ancestors. At last, with their mission complete, the hero twins ascended straight into the sky to become the sun and moon, thus bringing the light of the first true dawn to middle world or earth. In union terms, it would symbolize the bringing of the unconscious to consciousness. Their many ordeals also offer a reflection of individu individuation, which is a psychological process which can, is, happens in union analysis or other ways, obviously, um, of bringing what is unconscious to consciousness. Here we gain some inkling of the power and knowledge of Shibalba as the mythic underworld as reflected in the cosmos. It's, it's a theater of the soul, isn't it? And it depicts the movement of primordial forces, both creative and destructive, in an ever evolving, cosmic story of which we are a part. 
So I'd like to conclude today with a, with a quote from Jung. As far as we can discern, the sole purpose of human existence is to kindle a light of meaning in the darkness of mere being. So in, in this evening's presentation, I, I hope to have kindled some light. Thank you so much for coming. Uh -huh.